Forestry Commission, Environmental Protection Agency, Ghana National Institute of Bankers, and the media. I will chair this afternoon's session. My name is Richard Kodjoa Vugla. And uh, we have four persons that will be presenting this afternoon to us. And each talk will take 15 minutes and then we'll give five minutes for questions. Without much ado, I want to invite the first speaker, Nasir Din Malik, from University of Energy and Natural Resources. And he'll be presenting on mathematics, a key tool to societal development. Shall we give our hands to him once more? Good afternoon, once again, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, once again, ladies and gentlemen. I was, uh, as I was trying to climb up here, I took to the social media to find out what is really trending and what is true trending. In fact, to my surprise, uh, over the week, it was the, social, uh, the media that lost a colleague called Kaba. And in fact, one of the posts is suggesting that he deserves a state barrier. Yes, that is fine. I ask myself, what have we done to ourselves? Ghana and Africa has lost a cornerstone. Professor Aloti, he went as a fly. What have we done about it? I thought it was a golden opportunity for us to excite the world, to tell the people the value generation of mathematics. Yet again, we fail ourselves. Anyway. I'm presenting on the topic, mathematics, a key tool to societal development. Uh, uh, introduction, uh, this is the outline of, uh, of my presentation. It has to do with, I have the introduction uh, that has to do with the definition of mathematics, the importance of mathematics to the individual, and the importance of mathematics to the societal level. And at the societal level, we will be discussing two things. Uh, the contribution of mathematics to the uh, growing economy. That's a developing nation. And we look at the contribution of mathematics to the developed nations. In our case, we are using South Korea in the developed nation, and UK and Netherlands as uh, the developed nations. The question we ask ourselves, what is mathematics? Mathematics is the study of measurement, properties and relations of quantities and sets using numbers and symbols. But today, mathematics is much more than arithmetic and geometry. Mathematics seems to be a diverse discipline that deals with data, measurement, and scientific observation and inference, deduction and proofs, and then modeling of mathematical, uh, modeling of uh, natural pheno phenomena using mathematical models. Again, is mathematics useful at all? This is the question that will be addressed in the... This is how mathematics, the, the, the flow of mathematics, the importance of mathematics, the benefits of mathematics. First of all, we have mathematics at the top, at the personal level and the societal level. At the social level, at the personal level, we have social, intellectual, cultural, and vocational. Permit me to... Uh, elaborate on two. Vocational importance. I think um, living a good life and becoming more independent is what we seek in modern day education. Getting a good job. But before you can get a good job, you need to develop your brain very well. Um, the ability to solve a problem, uh, th that is a problem and its solution lies the human ingenuity human knowledge and intellectual power. Without this, you cannot develop yourself. 
Once again, you need mathematics in that sense. Uh, social level. At a social level, our, our entire life it has to deal with interaction. The, buy, the buying and selling in, in our market, sharing ideas. You need a mathematical mind for you to develop or uh, possibly correlate with the society very well. We come to the societal development. We have economic, science and technology, and education. I think economic, um, uh, the engine of every nation, every developing nation, uh, has to do with it economic improvement. Uh, yes, your development swaddles around economic uh, uh, improvement. Uh, in that matter, you need certain algorithms that you will devise, that will help you in the systems of your de uh, development you become more efficient and productive. When we come to science and technology, I need not to explain this furthermore. What, what I'm using here, the computer itself and the projector speaks for itself. Mathematics as a vehicle to economic development, the South Korean case. I think um, of somewhere in 1950, um, South Korea, let me give you a brief story about South Korea if you don't know. I think somewhere in the 1950s, um, South Korea was preoccupied by Japanese for almost 36 years. In fact, after their independence, a war broke up and left South Korea devastated. Nothing to go home, nothing to ride home about. They have nothing. In fact, South Korea was uh, an, mainly an agricultural country. Everything were destroyed. It got to a point in the 1950s, uh, South Korea decided to pursue a different angle. Yes, let's earn a good living. In earning a good living, how do we do? There are so many facets, there are so many ways you can develop your nation. But ask yourself, which one will be efficient and prudent? Yes, that's the question they posed to themselves. And the answer was, let's pursue mathematics education, which is very, very vital. It is the foundation of every economy. What did they do? Yes, the table shows uh, before, before independence, they had a GDP per capita of $76. And after that, they have $2,000. You can see, you can see for instance, that is around the $2,000. They recorded $20,000 per capita income. And this report was carried by, out by um, then Minister of Science and Technology, Dr. Kumon Nchong. Yes, this is the strategic planning, how they flow their economy progressively. First, they started to invest in resources, invest in resources. How did they do that? Infrastructure. First. Yes, they said they needed mass education. How do, do, will they go about it? They decided to invest, invest in schools, train teachers, and learning materials. Yeah, by then, 1950s, they were not having teachers. They were not having graduates. I, I think the record, record statistics shows that they had uh, around 16, uh, 16 graduates at that day, by then. So they decided to invest much in schools, build, putting up schools, nice uh, structures and then take a little time to train teachers in mathematics. And then they provided learning materials. I can tell you on record, uh, on record that by then, when you visit South Korea, the mathematics textbooks seems to be the first or probably second Bible. Every household seems to have mathematics book. It was all over the place. Everybody was learning mathematics because mathematics then was a measure of one social status. If you learn mathematics, yes, you have the, uh, the accolades. Secondly, they, they, they took to production of talented students. Yes, we needed, we want to grow our economy from an, uh, an import-driven nation uh, to an export-driven nation. They want to industrialize the economy. That was the whole concept. How do you do that? You needed the expertise. You needed the academia, the researchers. Yes, 
after investing much in, in students in mathematics, now they grew up very well. Then they embraced the various fields in, in science and technology, the engineering and whatever. So by then, these people fed into the academy. Some became researchers, the academia, some became technocrats. And then development started. They started to build uh, production industries, whatever. These individuals fed into, uh, into this industry. What was the main motivation behind people studying mathematics-related course? Yes, they decided to provide more jobs. The industry was job promising for students who are studying mathematics. If you are studying mathematics or related courses, by default, after completing your BAC, you have something to do. So this motivated people to go into the sciences. The sciences. But then, they, after then, they became a better state. Yes. We now go to contribution of mathematics to a developing, developed country. And UK and Netherlands is our, our case. I think uh, by then, uh, somewhere 2010, uh, the UK government decided to, to, to engage Deloitte, uh, and, and it is an accounting firm based in the UK. But now we have it across all the nations. They engaged this, this uh, firm to assess the economic impact of mathematics to the uh, UK's economy. Following the, the, following the findings of the UK economy, uh, the Netherlands also contracted the same firm to do, uh, uh, to do a case study, or uh, use the UK's one to, as a case study to, to find how mathematics contribute to the Netherlands economy. How do they do assess that? We have direct benefit, indirect benefit, and induced benefit. Direct benefit has to do with the jobs that uh, directly apply mathematics or generate mathematics. Indirect benefit, and an example is the computer science and education. Indirect benefit, we are looking at um, um, the computer science and education like this uh, uh, depends on goods and services. Uh, companies that provide goods and services to, to the jobs related, jobs that directly apply mathematics, is known as the indirect benefit. We have in, in, induced benefit. We are looking at the household expenditure by direct benefit and indirect benefit, like we, we have done here. After a short program, we went out and, and took a meal. The caterers and whatever, they are also getting something out of it. The Netherlands and the UK's economy, we have the table below. Employment, by then, the direct benefit, if you look at the table very well, the Netherlands, I think employment rate quantum has to, is 26% to the whole economy. And, and this is not easy. 20% contribution to the whole employment, I think it is something recommendable. And we, when we look at the GDP, that is the gross value added. And gross value added here is analogous to GDP. It contributed 30% to the whole economy. When you come to the UK, we could, you can see clearly on the table, boldly printed 34% to the employment uh, sector and corresponding 43% GDP. Is mathematics useful at all? These are the key, uh, our key findings. And recommendation to developing nations in, in, in Ghana. Uh, Ghana as a growing nation, actually, we cannot directly employ uh, successful, um, what do you call it? You look at their, their scientific models, their, their success story, and, and directly apply them to our nation. However, we can look at the South Korean case, we use it as a case study. We can mimic the way they grew their economy. But, uh, you can, Ghana, we have grown to a certain level. And it is not prudent for us to overhaul the whole system. Gradually, we can also start by resource building, building the economy, provision of uh, standard textbooks by government. Uh, provision of standard textbooks by government, we are looking at proper textbooks, not questions and solutions. Proper textbooks that will elevate students, 
that will, that will open the minds of students. We have two minutes. Oh, very well. The nature of students in mathematics. We have uh, student stratification. At the basic level, you identify good students, those who can go into the secondary schools and those who can go into vocational schools. Then you can put them, at, uh, everybody will be put them. Everybody can assess his or her talent. The third one, we have production of mathematics expertise. Through that, oh. yes. Production of mathematics expertise, expert, how can we do that? Uh, co cooperative research centers, we should establish more research centers, joint seminars, and also we have, uh, I think one has not been captured. We have uh, conferences like this where we can, the industry and the academia can come together. But one key recommendation is missing, science in mainstream politics. I, when I was coming here, I read on social media that strong connection is when you have your mother at the wedding grounds who is serving food and drink. Yes, when we begin to embrace modern day politics, get to, because nowadays investing in mathematical science and whatever is very, very painful because you will not get immediate results. And the politicians think about the next election. But when we have our own people there, they know the problems. They will invest much more in the math and science education. And I think I've already made my mind to toe that angle. And I need your blessing. In the next 30 years, 20 years, I will invest much in math and science education. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nasir. We'll open the floor for questions. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I really admire the way you did it, your courage and stuff. But please, can you tell me in the next five years, what are we going to see of you? Question again, please. In the next five years, yes. what are we going to see of you? Yes. What are your plans? I'm a student of mathematics, but then I decided to throw the line of politics, social politics. Very soon, in, in the next five years, I see myself uh, in the parliament. And after that, 10 years, beyond 10 years, I see myself as the vice president of Ghana. <laughs> Any other question? Yeah, um, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, one issue with mathematics from the basic school up to even secondary is a myth. The fact that people are so afraid of maths. People shiver when they see maths. How do we get the young ones to like maths and to study maths? I think we have a responsibility as a science community. Like I said earlier, we fail ourselves. We had a golden opportunity to, to make mathematics uh, uh, exciting at the death of uh, Professor Aloti. What do we do? The first thing we should do is to have proper training for mathematics students. I think the way forward is that uh, the past government built um, E-Block um, e Secondary School. This is a golden opportunity because we cannot invest in all the secondary schools. You understand? Let's pick three or four as strategic places where we can invest in it, make it recreational, very appealing. At that point, where we can train uh, mathematicians, scientists, when you have such buildings, such creative things, then you see the younger ones, hey, I want to be here tomorrow. I want to be here tomorrow. They see the green light in front of them. They will surely learn. Thank you, sir. Um, 
thanks for the presentation. Um, I want to ask, I mean, we live in a country where everyone wants their kid to be a doctor or a lawyer. And let's just say um, I'm an SHS graduate. I want to pursue mathematics. But then my parents uh, um, don't want me to do mathematics. They want me to probably be a doctor or something. How do you help me convince my parents to pursue a path in mathematics? Thank you. Yes, actually, it is very difficult in our in our in our countryside to convince a parent to 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 allow his child not to pursue a, a, a doctorate or nursing because by default, if you complete those institutions, you get a job. And I think independent, good living is the essence of modern day education. The parents are seeing it after completion, you get a job. That is why I'm suggesting that we should open up the, uh, the, the science industries where those industries, will, the much uh, science and mass related courses, jobs will be, will be uh, there will be much jobs over there. There will be jobs for people after completion. They'll get jobs to do as well. When they see that, that yes, after completion, I'm not going to stay home for five years, three years. After completion, I'm getting a job straight and I'm getting a huge sum of money. I think the parents will sit down. Yes, if I allow my son to go there, tomorrow he'll be able to take good care of me. My son, pursue mathematics, pursue engineering. <laughs> Okay, last one. Okay. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm very much impressed about your presentation. And, and this has been something that we've been discussing over years with colleagues in mathematics. Uh, so um, one of the things that uh, we've identified as a problem, you've, you've addressed them here. But uh, a follow-up question uh, about uh, you just mentioned that we should try to set up industries uh, whereby for, for mass and science, whereby students can get jobs over there, that will be a source of motivation. So this, uh, calls, this, this calls my mind of jobs that mathematicians can do, because it is also one factor that people don't really see the essence of math. Because myself, before I came to the university, someone suggested to me to come and do mathematics. I was like, ah, I don't want to become a teacher. That was the mindset. So this has been in the minds of people for so many years. So what are some of the jobs that you think mathematicians can do after school? Maybe that one will also bring some kind of motivation. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for the question. Somewhere, I think in 2010, uh, after, af after we discovered oil, uh, let me not start there. If you take Thor for, in for example, People are working there. The place is occupied, but yet Thor is running debt under debt. What is causing that? There are people working there. There are really people working there. If you are going for space, you will not get. There are people who don't even have the enthusiasm. They are not in the, mathemat uh, the mathematics field. They are not in the science field. They just got themselves there because they want job. We are not true to ourselves. The diligence is not there. We discovered oil. That was when people were rushing. Let's train people. Let's train people. The diligence were not there. We took so many bad minds over there to train. Today, the oil, I think the foreigners are running it for us. Our com companies are, uh, are collapsing, not because we don't have people there. We don't have uh, the efficient people there. I think diligence, it, it all boils down to diligence. The industries are there. You know, mathematical related person is versatile. Everywhere he enters, he can work very well, very prudent. It is now that it is, for your question, I think diligence has to do with Ghana. Diligence, proper diligence. Let's get the right people in the right industry. Otherwise, all the springing industries belong to mathematics and mathematics related courses. Thank you so much. So thank you very much. We we want to. I'm very grateful. Uh, I, I want to. <laughs> uh, okay, let me allow it, even though time is gone. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, 
Um, please, can you go to your references? References. Okay. Yes, I'm there. Should I go down again? No, it's all right. Um, okay. I think you've, you've listed a lot of, this is um, a scientific community, so I, I, I really want to, um, ah, okay. I mean, correct you on something. I mean, okay. um, I feel that um, where you referenced, okay. you, you must actually cite it in it. It looks as if um, you are, anything you say, you are conjecturing, because you, you have not used much of any data of your own. I mean, you didn't go to any field to collect uh, any data to. I think the thesis itself, I have cited every, at, at every point. But for the PowerPoint, that is, I didn't do that. But when you have the thesis itself, the proper documents of my work, this is just an asset. You will find out all this wherever it is necessary, I, I cite. But I, I feel that it shouldn't be so, no matter what, because we are, we are scientists and okay. we are prone to doubt. I think if I you want us in, to... I take it in good faith. Next time, I will do exactly the same. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, Shall we put our hands together? <laughs> our next speaker is Edu Sechi. He will be talking on piping flow erosion in the heterogeneous porous media. Shall we welcome him? Good afternoon once again. Um, my name is Adusachi. I'm a PhD student of NIMS. And um, um, this, this is an ongoing research. Um, so what we want to do actually today is to um, present an overview of what um, we are doing. So we, we might not have concrete results, but we just want to share what we have. My supervisor is Dr. Amakui Renchi. And as, as we know in Ghana, um, flood is a major concern. And so basically the interest in erosion was from this point. And we are working on piping flow erosion with sedimentation and deposition in the heterogeneous porous media. This is the content of what I want to talk about. Now, if I, water is the main load uh, hydraulic structure hold against throughout its period of exploitation. And as we know, if without maintenance, a hydraulic facility can collapse due to flooding. And so as far as research is concerned, we would always want to go around this subject, look at the dynamics of the flow, and some of the causes of the collapse. Now, if I, um, I briefly want to describe what a hydraulic structure is, and a hydraulic structure is simply a civil engineering structure whose sole purpose is to retain or transport water. And as we know, water not only being a natural resource, also possesses some kind of fluid energy. Therefore, this facility has to fight against this energy, and so the slightest fault, it can break. I, I decided to present this nice diagram, a case where there was a, a culvert, and, and due to an erosion, there's a collapse. And this basically can lead to flood. Good, now what are we doing? If, um, basically, the, if I have forces traversing a hydraulic facility, you know, such forces can either go through the solid phase or it can go through what, the fluid phase. If it goes through the solid phase, then usually we look at the intergranular shear forces, 
and if it goes to the fluid phase, in our case, water, we can look at a case where the water is in a permanent um, isotropic form, and so we have to talk about um, hydrostatic pressure, or a case where in a transient and isotropic form, and so we'll talk about hydrodynamic pressure. And as far as the hydrodynamic forces are concerned, this is known to cause a local pull out of the grains, which we usually refer to as erosion. And there are two criteria for application of hydrodynamic forces. One is the seepage flow, which we know causes internal erosion, and two is the stream flow, which produces external erosion. Our interest is in the first one. So what we, I want to do here is to define what the piping I'm talking about is. And it's, it's just um, an emergence and development of a continuous tunnel between upstream and downstream sides of a hydraulic structure instigated by the seepage flow. So from the diagram, we have uh, an embankment. You can look at this as a levee, whose purpose is to prevent probably a river or something from overflowing. And of course, due to this hydrodynamic pressures, we can have seepage in the embankment or in the foundation. And this can create a tunnel. And because, of course, when water is set into motion, it erodes the soil. With time, this levee can collapse. So this is where our interest is. According to a research by Fel et al. 203, they outlined the mechanism of this internal erosion or piping as initiation, that is the seepaging, then continuation of the erosion, and with time it progressed to form a continuous internal channel which leads to the bridge. And from the diagram I have on the board, there was a small, there was a seepage, and with time you have the collapse of the structure. Now we all agree mathematical models and numerical techniques are vital perspectives to explore and predict this mechanism. And according to a research by Liang, few models are available to ideally describe erosion due to the complexities of piping. And our interest was in, because there are other works, we, we were interested in a research by Bonelli, Tuosis, and Lachotti simply because they paid attention to the, the interface, that is the, the point at which the, the given fines joins the flow, thereby causing that kind of internal erosion. And though this model is there, however, it contains shortages and limitations for assumptions and simplifications. So basically what we want to do is, um, the, model, the previous model I just showed looked at the whole medium being homogeneous, which is not the case. And also, for simplicity, they, um, they kind of ignored the positions, which we know that if flues are set in motion, it erodes the fines. And based on probably the diameter of the particles, or even the orientations of the porous media, I can have the positions. That is some of the particles leaving the fluid. This is known to cause flow diversion phenomena due to these heterogeneities. So what we want to do is to obtain a robust model which incorporates this mechanism, and also we will lift it from the homogeneous medium into a heterogeneous medium. In other words, we are going to create some kind of uh, oscillations in the medium of concern. And then last, we would just, we would like to, depending on the model we get, we would develop an algorithm to numerically simulate the process. So what I am going to talk about is how do we um, look at this process in a heterogeneous medium. We decided to use homogenization. And um, homogenization dates back to about 100 years ago. It was developed by Maxwell Physics and Poincaré, And it's actually used in the industry, in the production of milk. So mathematically, this homogenization is just an approach to study the, instead of looking at the whole medium as being homogeneous, studying it at the macro level, we are going to go back to the microscopic level. And so we will study the micro behavior of the medium by its what micro properties, as I have in the diagram there. 
So basically, this is what we are doing. We are, just, we are not just assuming that the medium is homogeneous, but what we are doing is we want to replace, we want to move from the heterogeneity and then through asymptotic analysis, replace this with what? A homogeneity. So as, if you look at the diagram I have, my domain, there's some kind of oscillations here. So what we want to do is we would go to the microscopic level where there are oscillations, and then through asymptotic analysis, we will try to get an equivalent homogeneous medium to work with. Now, our inhomogeneous medium, we define it as a, lookup, a medium with local parameters, which can be described by functions rapidly varying with respect to space variables. Therefore, it means that we can model this medium with PDs, which have rapidly oscillating coefficients. So where is the mathematics? This is where the mathematics comes in. In homogenizations, we look at the physical phenomena in a micro homogeneous media as the local characteristics depending on a small parameter, epsilon. This epsilon, we are calling it the characteristic scale of the microstructure. It's nothing done. You see, I said we are studying the micro level from the macro level from the micro properties. So what we are doing is we are going to define some kind of a mesh distance which is simply the ratio of the microscopic length scale and the microscopic length scale. And as I said, we will look at our medium as being oscillatory. And so if I take a unit cell, which is what I have here, I'll create a lattice of copies around the medium. That will give me my heterogeneities. And then through asymptotic analysis, we will try to replace this heterogeneous with this homogeneous medium. There are two forms of homogenization. We have um, um, the one by former asymptotic expansion, and then um, the second one we call the rigorous approach. The difference is this. Former asymptotic analysis uses a kind of theta series. That's the answers of homogenization. Two minutes. And then use this to remove the oscillatory behavior of my medium. And at the end, you get um, an average model equation with explicit rules for computing effective coefficients. The rigorous, of course, introduces weak solutions to scale convergence, compactness, and then it uses the framework of Sobolev and Bochner spaces. And of course, we would also incorporate weak convergence and compact embeddings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sechi. Questions? OK, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you made mention of um, changing the pulse media to, from heterogeneous states to homogeneous. And by so doing, I know some data will be lost along the line. So I didn't see in your presentation where you capture how you can manage those errors that uh, will evolve in, in terms of changing the heterogeneous to the homogeneous. Same way with the micro, uh, microscopic stage to the macro stage. I know there are data, so some structures will be lost. So how are you going to cater for those ones? Thank you. All right. Um, these are models and they are estimations. Um, Basically, those available assume the medium as being homogeneous. Okay. And um, instead of going with that, of course, we know real life, the porous medium is heterogeneous. Okay. So we know there will be lots of data as a result of the asymptotic analysis. But hopefully, this is going to capture some dynamics that the previous model does not, though you lose the data but it will be far better than what is available. Okay. Uh, Mr. Edim, thank you for your presentation. So should we say that your model is going to be the generalized model in this case, uh, compared to what literature has already provided to us? I would say no. Um, I would say no, simply because um, 
um, I would rather say it's it's it will be um, um, an update model on the previous models, which works better. Because we are not really looking at some distribution or something. Okay, it's my No, it's a trivial question, really. Mm. <laughs> I, I thought that um, flood, for example, is a natural disaster. Yeah. And by... And for many people, if it's a natural disaster, there's nothing you can do about it. So what are you doing exactly? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's better to lose two people than to lose ten people. Um, so in as much as it's, it's, it's a natural disaster, of course there are measures you can put in place to minimize the effects. And that's the interest here. Yeah, no. Yeah, hello. One thing I know is that for numerical models, they are without flaws. So how are you going to validate your model in the um, setup, if possible? Numerical models are without flaw. They are actually so, with flaws. Yeah, so how are you going to validate your, your model that you want to use? Um, as I said, we we... We are starting, the, I mean, we are, the whole model depends on a parent model, okay? And our aim is to capture certain dynamics of the flow as well as the domain of concern. So ideally, we, in, in terms of validation, I would say at the end, we will try to compare the behavior of the existing model with our model. And hopefully, our model capturing the dynamics of the flow, that's all. What I said, so what are the parameters that you want to measure, the parameters and the setup, to so uh, that you can give the floor level that maybe is 10% or 20% accurate? The setup, or maybe you don't have the setup now. I, I do not, but in terms of parameters, we are really concerned about the viscosities, the permeabilities of the medium, as well as the velocities of the flow. one from oh yeah okay somebody okay so we'll continue let's thank him once more time the next speaker is going to talk on application of magnetic and electric geophysical methods in delineating auriferous structures in the century belt of Ghana. And this will be delivered by Farid Majid from Department of Geological Engineering, UMAT. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished uh, academicians and my other colleagues in the industry. I'm highly privileged to stand before you to um, explain to you. In fact, when I was coming, I was expected to be given 30 minutes because there are a lot of things I will say that may confuse you. This is geology, so, so I even changed the topic so that people can understand. Now it's hydrothermal or deposit model uh, using magnetic and electrical geophysical tools with structured data set within the safety belt. In 1925, um, a wonderful astrophysicist called Edwin Howard, or Howard, um, propounded a powerful law that the universe is ever expanding. However, in, or in our scientific disciplinary, that is an amazing theory, I love that. But in our scientific theory, I realized that the disciplines are rather emerging or merging. That is why we thank the organizer of this program that some of us can come. And we see that math or mathematics is the, the center of all the disciplines. In Ghana, we have 
about six gold belts, just like the belts we wear. And one of them was famous, the, the Ashanti belt that has proved provided over a million or 100 million ounces of gold in the past 100 years. The next one that um, investors want to focus is the safety belt that I've seen very little exploration. And the belt has produced significant gold you know, in the Ashanti belt. However, we can see, day in and day out, we hear of uh, companies relegating their workers or offloading them because of the diminishing gold content. So now our focus is the underground. What about the safety belt? Nobody wants to go there. There are a few mines there, like the Kenya C. Newmont. So my work wants to look at bridge the mathematics and using geophysical tools in order to understand the structure settings and the geochemical settings. So when you sort of to do exploration, it's extremely capital intensive. And most of these companies fold up. They don't end up with a mine. Why? Because they have to be able to know what exactly they want, where to focus their attention, and how to explore. Normally, we have the genetic model, which is there, like the hydrothermal veins, the magmatic, the supergene arrangement, and whatever. But the exploration model is a problem, which requires tremendous work. Now, we know that there's no single tool that can bring out the gold. But if you're able to build a very good logical hypothesis testing, you will be able to, or it will lead you to a gold. So we need to ch carefully choose efficient and optimum tools in order to come out with a good model. So my work is to integrate geophysics, structure data sets, and the use of power of GIS, geostatistics to model or create a hypothetical model of such or referrals or gold systems. Now, Fugro has done or did elaborate work airborne and in 1994, 2000, they also did some work also in the safety belt. And the integration of such method has proven worthwhile. So that motivated me to look at it. So uh, the study is aimed to attempt to uh, eliminate all the structures very well so that we can go in and then get what we want at the optimum um, cost. So my work is to produce a mineral potential map and test it. So I need to have a definitive potential gold mineralization trend using the structure indices. Uh, develop an inferred geometry and nature of the mineralized body at depth and able to image all the structure studies well and provide some target to drill for resource estimation. So this is the area of study in the safety belt around Fidim or Fimia and Aboso. And the geology there, uh, very complex, extremely complicated. And some of the names might sound horrible. It's in the Bremian volcanic of uh, orogenic type. It's structure, uh, controlled strength. You know, structures are the pathways for the gold when they are coming. Gold is in a hot fluid system. So when they are coming uh, beneath or just above the, the, the magmatic chamber, they need structures to move. They need conduit fissures to move. So these fissures are the structures. So when they are formed, structures can also deform them again. When they are faulting, <laughs> they will deform the, uh, the, the, the system. So how do we find them? So there are various um, units or elements or minerals that are susceptible to geophysical trends. And geophysics depends on contrast. So you have to choose the best geophysical tool. And in safety belt is mainly the um, disseminated uh, sulfide that is very good to be detected by IP or induced polarization. And the structures, magnetic, will do that magic for us. Oh. Now this 
was how I went through uh, the data acquisition. And then I we performed the magnetic processing. And then we do the electrical. Electrical has the IP or induced polarization, and then what we call the dual section. Once we look at the sufficient trend, we also have to check the, the depth wise, how deep is the structure, and then uh, take structure measurement. Now for the data processing, the magnetic will give our TMI, or the reduced to pull anomalies. These anomalies will provide um, causative bodies sitting right um, as if it's taken in the, in the pole. And then the electrical will produce re resistivities or chargeability anomalies. And then we use much more of intuition, use a lot of experience in order to extract these liliaments that are related to geology. So the geology, we look at the alterations, the little, little classifications, like you can hear of granite or sericides, or these are susceptible to either magnetic um, trends, or if you like, induced polarization, if there is disseminated sulfide. Then after this data analysis, we do, or this falls into the classify into the quali qualitative or the quantitative. And then finally, you have to derive a mineral potential map based on the interpretation that we place on these results. So this is a schematic presentation of how a magnetic survey is done, and the IP, and then of course. Now when we do, when we finish the geophysics, when you finish the magnetic, it goes through a lot of processes. We have to first go through the post enhancement processes. We need to tweak it. We need to um, perform some algorithm what the system or the background uh, uh, softwares contain. We need to upward continue it, that is to remove sufficient noises so that we can get the in-situ responses. Then, as I said, you have to also reduce the pool to get the symmetric anomalies. This is, will help in classifying our lithologies. Then we have to apply first order derivative or second order. This is a high pass filter that will give a textural enhancement. And this is what we base to um, take out the lineaments or to um, process the lineament settings. And these are related to gold anomalies. Then we also have to do tilt derivative for the magnetic. Then we have to process the, the electrical too. The electrical, we did the IP or induced polarization and the geoelectric sections, right? The first one is called gradient. We use a minimum curvature because it is, it's fairly um, good for such data um, packages. And then the electrical also, we, we fall on the Lucky uh, model tool that they use smoothness constraint in order to get a, a depth-wise um, information that we can relate to the structures. So we base on this geological mean spatial features, the shear zones that we have to look out for favorable hot rock units and then hydrothermal alterations. So, this is a, the uh, result of what we got from the ground magnetics. Then this is the extraction of the lineament. This is based on uh, geological intuition, right? These are basically where we are likely to get gold mineralizations. So we interpreted them as boudins and doctor shear zones and schistosities. This are marvelously good for mineralization. This also tells us the depth to the sources of mineralization. And we can also infer, infer fault and, and other discontinuities. And finally, we're able to produce a mineral potential map hypothesis, or this is a hypothetical model yet to be tested. 
So we're able to distinguish three main literary units, look at the structural trends, we're able, to, we're able to update the geological map, which of course, geological uh, department and mineral inspectorates really need them. And also we're able to infer conductive charges and we were also able to conclude that first part drilling will aid in the understanding. Now there's further work to be done. Uh, Golden Star is doing a lot of drilling, and so here we were able to dynamically follow and test this model. We want to do ground-based radiometric, we'll do a lot of core structure logging. And GSR is almost weekly drilling a hole, so we're able to get um, a, a week, you can get about uh, 500 uh, meter sampling. And we're also proposing uh, AI uh, neural network to also optimize this way because when this works which has been done elsewhere, we can cut down the costs. We will minimize the drilling spaces and this will enhance or optimize the overall. We also, I'm also planning to look at um, a downhole of fiscal law just as is being done in the oil field. And this, we made a lot of discussions and we hope to get this uh, kickstart as early as possible so that we can be able to have refinement of models as we make more measurements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Let me go this way. Okay. Thank you very much, um, sir. I think, um, first of all, allow me to um, say that um, you've really enlightened me with um, a lot of geological jargons and all that. <laughs> you kept bombarding me here and there. But then um, you made mention of um, the fact that there are other models for um, hydrological and all that, but for the geological, you don't have something, it's a model that you use to detect the gold and all that. So I was expecting to see something like that, even though you gave them um, some of the key uh, what do you call it? Some of the key players in um, the geological field. Uh, you made mention of how you use some um, systems, differential equations, to sift through the data. But I was actually looking forward to seeing the model. You gave results to the model, but then the model itself, I didn't get to see anything of that. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, as I said, these are a back background information that uh, uh, software we are looking at what the software is providing. We basically fall on the software to, to um, do this integration or to model all these things. But we actually want to build our own script. That is what a uh, few of the maths guys that I've met, we want to look at. So the software is, is predetermined what they have to tell us. And that is what our hands are tied on that uh, models that the software are giving us. And this is just a quick follow-up. Um, um, with this software that you are, um, you are, you are basing your, um, like you are using as the yardstick, has it been validated? Has it been proven? Yes. Okay. okay thank you. It has. It, it, uh, companies are paying thousands of dollars <laughs> annually, you know, to use these softwares, like um, Gemcom, like Separk, right? They're paying thousands of dollars, so it's been used, it's been tested, but not, we're also thinking that our area, our auriferous gold terrain needs much rigorous um, scripting. We have to do it locally. So thank you for the question. Okay, my question is, um, why Kenya say? and not Boko or Navrongo. Uh, thank you. Um, as I mentioned, there are about six gold belts. We have the Ashanti belt, we have the Sefi Bebieni gold belt. We have the, um, the Asankagwa ill belt. It does properly defined. And we, let me make it more easy. The Ashanti belt is where Golden Star, um, Goldfields, Idriaprim, Wasa, they are sitting on it, enjoying it for the past 100 years. Pristia, uh, Sefi is where 
Kenya say is sitting, right? Again, Ashanti is where um, I am free is sitting on. But the Sefi is the next most generational belt to look at, the most extensive, right? And then, so it, 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 was, it was pertinent that we look at that instead of Ashanti where everybody has, has dealt with extensively. Just a follow-up. So if you have the motivation, is it likely that you will try your model in the north? Sure. That, that's supposed to be the long-term uh, um, plan. Okay. Uh, please, I would like to find out how your model is um, different from the other models we have with relation to this particular work. Because we geophysics, we have a lot of softwares that can do exactly this work. So how is yours different from what we have? Thank you. <clears throat> Most of the softwares, you generate almost the same model because um, I'm very good in SEPAC, and my colleague was also very go extremely good in GEMCOM, and we modeled two systems. and. Uh, the outcome was basically the same. So we thought, that, well, SEPAC and GEMCOM has really stayed long and they, they've helped the Ashanti Belt to produce over millions of ounces of gold. So we, we could still use it. But again, we will want to look at the local setting, right? So we want to look at our own script. We want to train the data to minimize or optimize the overall efficiency of the work. Um, just a contribution to the conversation. Yes, you see when you look at what he presented, uh, the gentleman, hello. When you look at what he presented, for example, when he was looking at the filters, he said the first degree, um, first order filter. That basically means that they, they have decided that the, the function there is a very linear form. Okay, it, would, it doesn't produce the required results that you want. But that's what the software will give you. So based on the geology of the plate, it may be necessary to look at other ad orders of, of the derivative, even fractional orders. And they are not looking at that yeah. now. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Um, please, when you started your presentation, you made mention of um, mining companies laying off workers. And um, your key objective was to generate a mineral potential map. So I want to ask if this potential map that you've been able to come up with would help to reduce the laying of workers by these mineral or mining companies. How does this potential map help to reduce the laying of workers in the mining field? <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> of course, when we find more gold, we need more hands on deck. But you know, exploration laid workers before the mining. So my work is basically to look at exploration. Once more guys, more of you years to finish school are pushed into the exploration, then we're hoping that mining will come in the near future. So, um, that should, that should be the fact that at the end of the day, we should need more people to be in the system to work. Okay, so, sorry. So please, till the mining come in the near future, uh, those people should remain laid off or unemployed. <laughs> Unfortunately, maybe yes or no. We'll see. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, to add to that, I said that now they are shifting attention to underground. You know, for Ashanti Belt, for example, all the easy targets are gone. So they are shifting attention to uh, underground. Kenyansi have started two underground mines. Golden Star have started two underground wasa and priests. You know, so it means that there's alternative, right? Even underground takes more people than surface. So let's hope that this work or in federance of the models will identify easy targets underground as well to get more people. 
Okay. Um, um, you made mention of a software in which you use to run your model to see your results. Um, and then you also mentioned that people pay millions of dollars just to use a software. And this is where uh, a problem is coming from, whereby we, the locals, we cannot generate our own softwares to solve our own problems, for which we are capable of. Um, ne nevertheless, um, you mentioned an alternative by using the local means to solve such problems. So I want to know, with this alternative, do you mean that uh, we are developing our own software similar to what has existed, probably better than what is there to do the job, or what do you mean by the local means uh, in solving a problem? Thank you. Thank you. There is this part in that when I draw one meter, one hole, one at a one meter and another in the hundred meter, and there is good anomalies, I need to put some holes in between, maybe five or four. Right. So what if we can train the data, right? And this data is so efficient to give that required result, then this drilling cannot come on. So we save thousands of bucks. And that can be done by simply scripting. And that's where we need a math guy. That's why I'm happy to be called here. Right. Can I come again? Yes. Um, from basic geology, we know that there are good bearing rocks. And if, as, as you saw in your presentation, if you know that the Biriman rocks will give us gold or aluminum, can't we easily ask scale to other places where we have the Biriman rocks? No, please. Why? Because it is not only Biriman that we are looking at. We are looking at complex settings. The Biriman even has to get structures. The structures has to be remobilized, right, into different strains and deformations. So if you have a Bremian, which is massive, there's nothing there. There are Bremian elsewhere that can produce iron, right, like the Liberia and other areas. So we can't say this lithology should produce this, the ore, but there are other structures that should play a part in order to get some mineralization which we call oriferos. So thank you very much. <laughs> the final presentation for the day. Numerical investigation of the trajectory of oil spill particles in the coastal waters of Ghana. This will be delivered by Felix Uber. From Mechanical Engineering Department, KNUST. Good afternoon. My name is Felix Cuba, and I'm here to present. Yeah. So I'm here to present on the topic numerical investigation of the trajectory of oil spill particles in the coastal waters of Ghana. And this is the outline. We use oil in every we use oil in our cars, not only in our cars, but also in these industries. We have cleaning industry, we have the pharmaceutical, we have the plastic industry, and the rest. And when oil is delivered through the, through the supply chain, there are always inherent risk. And this, are, and this, is, this is what happens. When the, whenever it's, it's been delivered through the supply chain, we have some risk that can affect the sensitive ecosystem, local businesses, health and safety, tourists, recreation, and regional industries. 
The best way is that whenever you are supplying or uh, the oil going through the supply chain, there should be no be any incident like um, oil spill or any like any problems. So the best way is that you should not have any oil spill or any difficulties when you're transporting oil. When oil occurs, when spill occurs, this is what happens. Our shared values like our ecosystem, industries are all polluted. So this is what I want to prevent. So, how, so the question is, how can we work together to proactively protect our shared values? Our shared values, as we saw earlier on, are our, our sensitive ecosystem, local businesses, health and safety, tourists and recreation, regional industries. So how can we protect all these ones? There are only two, preparedness and response. So before you can be prepared, you have to go through some, some activities. Let me skip these ones. So the activities for preparedness are one, identify potential events, plan scenarios, develop response strategies, and provide provision of resources. Let me get through, let me go inside each of them. For the preparedness, it means that you just go to the coast, you just go to the coast or where you have your oil spills, where you have your drilling, identify places where you think there can be oil spill, then you do simulation on that very locations. Then during the location, during the spillage or during the exercises, you just analyze. We'll see these things through the, the, the simulation. So, then you look for ways that you can also take the oil from the environment. Then you look at how to also to deploy materials to where the oil spill occurs. So when you are combating oil spill, these are what you also go through. You initial, initial deployment, you will see all this in through the model. So if you want to combat any oil spill, government should be involved, industry should be involved, and the community. So Tech, for instance, should be on the industry. So we are supposed to look for possible places where we can have oil spill and how to fight them or combat them. And the government is supposed to bring resources. And then you're also uh, supposed to educate the community on how to fight or stop spills. So justification. Ghana has discovered oil. And through that, our shared values are under risk. So we are supposed to do such a work. So numeral, uh, models have also helped us to understand some real life activities. And in this work, I use Mohit model. And it's a very big model. I, I, I got a chance to work with some, some guys outside to develop part of this model. So we are many, we are about 50. So this Portugal, and we developed the code, it's about 250 million line of codes. 250. <laughs> no, no spaces. <laughs> so 250, and completely Fortran. And we use a little of Perl and Python at times. And so completely Fortran, 250 lines of codes. So I use the model in Ghana, that's the coastal areas of Ghana. Engineers don't like too much talking, so I'm just making it simple. Then I use one approach. There's one approach for this model. We use the nesting model approach. There's one particular problem with, uh, with modeling, numerical modeling, cost and time. So if you use the nesting approach, you reduce the cost, you reduce the time also. And one thing too is that um, boundary conditions too is a problem for numerical models. So to wash away the instabilities in Errors involved in the in the in the in the boundary conditions. Using this approach is the best because we know that one, as you progress into the space within whether space or time, you wash away all errors involved in the in the boundary conditions. So my my real place is in the middle, the third domain, first domain, second domain. It's a way of washing away all the errors involved in the in the boundary conditions. So this is the best way of doing it. There are other ways of doing it, but this is the best. Because I, I, I ran this thing on my i73. It took about three months to finish. But if you, use, if you use the other methods to run it, you take about one year. So please, don't try running this on your computer. So as we know, 
models are without flaws. So to validate my model, I took some places around the, the coast. So Takradi, Cape Coast, Accra, and Tema to validate my model. What am I validating? So I check the water level. And looking at it, the red one is Okay, the red one is the field data, then the blue one is the model data. And we can see that they are all in shape. So the deviation is 20% to 17%, which is okay. So I can say that my model is almost a real-time mm -hmm. problem. So I can use my model to then look at how far oil, oil particles will, will travel to when there's any oil spillage. Then I also did, did an validation, that's the salinity, and it's also corresponding well. I also did that one for temperature. Then I also look at how the current moves in the coast. And we can also see that those from the coast, when you are standing by the coast, that all the waves move this way. Right? And you can see that my model too is predicting exactly so. Then we can see some place where you can see this place. I was in the country, but I stood up by around May, uh, May or June, there were some complaints about tides, high tides at the coast, Takrade or so. And my mother was able to show that around that time, you have strong tides there. So you can see that there are strong tides there, here. And at times, we have strong tides too around the Keta region. So you can use my mother to verify and see all, the, all those places. Okay, so this is the hydrodynamics. For a time, this is under hydrodynamics, and it changes. So now I want to look at how far oil particles will move when they are spilled in the water. Okay. So these are the locations. So I took these places, A, B, C, they to be the place where I'm going to spill the particles to see how far they will go. So A is longitude and latitude, they are all stated at the other side. So let's see what happens. So for point A, for point A is somewhere here. After some hours, we can see where it is. Some hours after a day, half a day and a half, look at where it is. So we can see that where we have our exploitation, uh, our production of oil, if there's any oil spill, after a day and a half, it will be beached here. Let's take another location for um, C. So this is the spill. After some hours, a day is beached. Then this is the point of discharge. It got beached. Let's look at um, point H, this place. So after some hours here, it went, in this case, the oil particles were not beached at the coast, but it went somewhere else. So we can see that this small part here, let's say Elubu and Azim, it's like that we don't have, if there's any oil spill, they are not susceptible to any oil particles. But from here up to there, they are all vulnerable to oil spill particles. So maybe if Zoom Lion Zoil want to buy a software to predicting, you can come and buy this. I'm not selling it very expensive, 2000 <laughs> This advert. So, so when you buy this software, it will tell you places that you can have oil spill beaching. And we don't have to waste our resources to build oil spill compact equipment here because if there will be any oil spill, then it will be from Cote d'Ivoire. But for our own activities here, they are not vulnerable to any oil spill particles. But from this side moving, they are, they are, they are vulnerable. So this is a conclusion. So in all, about eight locations were included in the research in the, in the as follows, stated there. In conclusion, it took oil particle two days Six hours, one day, 17 hours, three days, four hours, one day, 
one day, four days, one hour, and 22 hours spelling to get beach at the shore. For particle located at point zero, zero 005 east and 55 five north, they were beached out of, the, out of Ghana. So that's what you can see. So thank you. Question time. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I was thinking I would have seen uh, some kind of uh, equation because you keep saying models, yes. but uh, I would like the, to know the set of equations and then the numerical approximation method, which you actually use because I did not hear that as well. For the equations, you use Navier-Stokes equation. Very Navier-Stokes big. equation. Very, very big. Very big. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very big. So you have to break it down, energy, couple it. So I'll say that we, we use about 250 million lines of course. You can't touch it. So, so number of stock is the main body. Then the other one came inside. And the numerical approximation uh, technique you used? TBD, okay. we use. There are a lot. TVD, we use. Um, we use the back web, we use the forward, we use the central, we use, these are a few that I can remember of head. Okay. Hello. Okay. Um, I will inform Zoom line as well that you have a software to, for sale. Sorry? I said I will inform Zoom line as well our oh, software. Um, I have a question. Um, your estimate for the time frame for the flow of the spillage, okay. what assumptions do you make to get that time frame? Because okay, some of the uh -huh. assumptions that, um, which I think like a reflection, I said that maybe when the oil gets to the beach, either it should be attached to the, to the land at times, you can also say that there should be reflection. At times, too, you have oil particle. When they get down, it should come back, depending on the viscosity and then the coefficient of friction at the bottom. These things, I went to um, Ghana Port and Harbor. They don't even have nautical chart. It's a big problem. So at times, I was approximating at the coast. You see, models have. You see, uh, for satellite, they cannot give you the real depth of the sea. That's what my big guy is doing. Uh, uh, Dr. Mark, can we see you? That's what he's, he's doing. And to get the depth of the sea is a problem. So I use satellite data. So I went to Ghana, Port and Harbor to give me. They said they don't have. So, did, so I have some small, small approximation that I did at the coast, which is not the best. So at times, you see, when you get to Keta moving to Togo, you see, I've forgotten that I was very, very young. Our former president, they did some hydraulic belts. They built some hydraulic belts to prevent the water from getting to the land. All those things have to be taken care of. But satellite data cannot really pick it. So around that point, I was having problems trying to put the boundaries there. I hope you remember that we have sea belts, seal belt there. Satellite cannot pick that kind of data. Yes. So there are some of our problems that I was doing, which gave me problems. But it's okay. What? Then also our lagoons too. You see, we, we don't also have records of our river discharge. And all these things empties into the sea. The sea is a big tank, a, a big tank. And the more you empty, so we don't have the discharge rate. And looking at our lagoon, calling lagoon and all these things, if we don't have records on it, I have to just say, okay, three meters, three, this, this, it's a big problem. So if students can also take the discharge rate of our rivers, lagoons, it's okay. Then it will up. That's why the percentage is around 20 to 17. Yeah. I'm also thinking that it will, you have to also consider the time of year. Sorry? The time of year. The year, okay. The, the lagoons, the rivers, even the position of the moon can determine how the sea will behave. Yeah. So 
they can drastically change your assumption. So you have to yeah. also consider that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll have questions. Okay. Yeah. Right. I was going to ask you about the variables that you use in defining your your flow. Your the movement of your particles. Okay. I mean the main ones. Yeah. What, what, what do you consider? I use I force my model with atmospheric that's precipitation. I have wind, sunshine. Um, then for the sea, salinity, temperature, then velocity. And you had this, I mean, you know, on our coastal belt, you have this data already? No. So because I, we have a satellite, I, I did this thing at um, Technico, and I was lucky to meet guys working on on EU big projects, so they gave me the data. The French, they are very good with this kind of work, so I got guys who gave me data. It's surprising, Canada data is with someone, and we don't have access to it. <laughs> Canada data is with someone, we don't have access to it, so I have to beg them. Then they said, why don't you write to the government where I release it? I said, I beg you. So they gave me a few that I forced my mother with it. All right. How did you validate your... <laughs> yeah, we, we have, we have, there's no internet here, like, we have agar floats, and um, it's an institute in France, there's some agar floats, it contains all the instruments, and it's in the sea, about millions of them, they've just threw it into the sea, and whenever they are moving, they, meet the, they measure the temperature, salinity, everything, it moves down, up and down, it moves in the sea. And surprisingly, whenever it gets to Ghana, our fishermen always, when they get to take it, then they go and sell it. It, it gets to the coast here. I don't know whether you've seen one before, but they are, it's, it's a small instrument, like my hand. It floats in the, in the sea. They're picking data. When it picks the data from the sea, it comes out, take it to the satellite. When it gets to the coast, then they just hijack it. Uh, so that's reason, where sorry. I got... I got some of my information from, but for Ghana, we don't have enough. Yes, that, yeah. that's my problem. You know, you, you keep on saying because we have these problems, um, you, you get the data from elsewhere. Doesn't yeah. that indicate that what you are showing us now is not a real model for Ghana? Oh, that, that's oh, what okay. I'm thinking, but it's okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, but for the few that I got, that's what I did the validation. Uh, we have one more talk to go. <laughs> okay. Please, I, I want to know that the position of um, the, I don't know how to call it, the oil at any, any time, um, does it solely depend on the, um, uh, the direction of the flow? I mean, the waves? No, the, no, no, no. It does not depend on no. that? No. Okay. It depends on chloride force declination, how the earth is moving, a lot of things. Okay. And then um, I was also concerned about um, the, you said you use Navia Stokes, right? Navia Stokes is the father of all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, and <laughs> um, I was just wondering, um, and um, when my learned friend there asked about um, how you yeah, the numerical approach in solving. You you right. mentioned that you used um, um, the the forward, backward, and central. How possible is that? I was just wondering. <laughs> I've been thinking loud about that. Oh, oh, um, um, if perhaps I should see you. I mean, back doors. <laughs> yeah, you said it. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you very much for your presentation. My question is about your um, Fortran. You said you have uh, so many lines of Fortran code. I'm wondering why. Is it that you didn't do some optimization or why would you have this number of Fortran code lines? The second part of it is um, of late, um, when you talk about uh, programming in Fortran, you would always have computer scientists guys saying Fortran is outmoded. And 
and for me, I, I still like Fortran. So what would you say to these guys, and why would you have to code your model in Fortran? Uh, okay, this should not be a contest, but if you really know programming, you know that like they all excel in their fields. They all excel in their fields. So that's why, because of how complex, that's why they brought MATLAB. So they always say, why don't you learn MATLAB? But to me, if you really want to do scientific computation, big lines, then go for Fortran. But if not too big, then Python or Python or MATLAB is okay. <laughs> no, that's true. It's, it's very true. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. Thanks for your presentation again. Um, I would just like to know, you know, when you take, if, if you're forcing your model with just surface winds, okay, and then we know oil spillage could occur at deeper layers, which could be more current driven. Now, don't you think then your approximation could be a bit biased? Yeah. Um, yeah. Everything I'm taking care of. <laughs> See, it's decrystallized. <laughs> and I've done that too. I did that. And that's why it took about three months to finish. When, it's, when I start, I have to just put my computer off and take a beer and wait for it to finish. Like you listed there. Thank you. Um, thank you for no, no, your presentation. The one behind you. Uh, oh, let me. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> and um, my question, I'm coming from a coastal plain, that's Senya Broku. Okay. So from your model, I saw that we are really affected. So, High tides, eh? Yeah, yeah. And it's true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, please, my question is, so what's your advice to, to, the, to the government or to the public at large? Regarding to this oil spillage, should they stop oil production or something of that sort? Oh, no. Uh, we can also, the best is that we stop oil mining or oil, but we need the money to, to move the, the economy. So we still have to do it, but we should put measures in place. So what are some of the measures? Oh, okay. That's contingency planning, like what I'm doing. So if you know the possible thing that will happen if there's any oil spillage. So Zoyal will buy, they the position themselves well before an oil spill occurs. So they don't have to wait for an oil, oil spill to occur, then they'll start moving around, looking for where to start from. So looking at it, if you hear that an oil spill occurs here, maybe it occurs there, you start from here, then I, I should be laughing in my room. See, so if it occurs at the left, move to the far left and start fighting and come back. Right, so that is, these are all the things that we are doing. Right. I have a suggestion here. Your, your figures are okay. straightforward and absolute. I think you should put them in confidence interval. Give us a plus or minus so that we are confident about your values. My values? Yeah, yeah, yes. The error. Your hours of reaching the coast and everything. I think they should be put in a confidence interval, oh, okay. even as the plus or minus, where we can, we can be confident about oh, what okay. you have said, yes. <laughs> well taken. So let's put our hands together. <laughs> we will have to do with one more talk. I thought this was the last one. Dr. Mark Amubuatin will not be available tomorrow. So since we have gained some time, we want to bring him in to give his talk on very large scale stochastic optimization on mobile phones. So let's welcome him. Good afternoon, 
Um, unfortunately, I have to go back to my university for an emergency meeting, so I requested that I present before I go. Okay. So my name is um, Mark Amubwatin, and I've been working on an interesting project for a number of years now. Today I'm talking about very large stochastic optimization. Okay. My colleague Uba just mentioned that once he started running his model, he had to wait for um, three months. And it's typical for many models. I remember when I was doing my PhD and how to calibrate um, a water model, the Shinanji model, which had only 16 parameters. You needed to wait for five days to just get one result. And then if it's not OK, you have to rerun again. Um, my other colleague, um, Dr. Kwekweje, he had to wait for three weeks. And I remember on his third one run, on the third three weeks that he was waiting for his results, the day before his machine shut down. And <laughs> so during that time, I began thinking, is, is it the problem with solving large-scale optimization? Is it because we need much more hardware or we can do something about it? So look, globally, if you look around, um, countries are racing to build supercomputers, OK? And um, the Rus Russian president actually believed that any person who has um, power or autonomy, so, uh, let's say a superior AI, okay, you would control the world. So countries like China, US, Russia, they are all rushing to build supercomputers. And China has actually taken the lead with um, the um, Sanryu 2 supercomputer, which has about 93 teraflops of computing power. So the question I ask that we, we are in Africa. Um, I'm not sure we've even started thinking about building our own supercomputers. Okay. So what do we do? Because we need data. We need to run our models. We need to solve. Let's say if you, if you are solving for finding a new drug, you are doing new drug discovery, you need to run all these models. The only option is to um, go to the cloud, and probably that might be cheaper, but you also risk losing um, your intellectual property. Okay. So with the advent of data, which is actually really exploding, um, a lot of sensors coming up, mobile phones, and we having to deal with all of this and having our models to solve, how then do we actually go ahead and, and take advantage without the supercomputing hardware? So I began looking at this problem. Actually, when I started doing my PhD, when I had to wait for five days, I, I didn't want to wait. Um, each time I had to wait for five, I didn't want to do that. I didn't have time for that. So I decided, let me see what's the main problem with large scale optimization models. Where we are talking about, you have like over 100 um, decision variables which you have to solve or you have to optimize. So, how, how, what's the main challenge? And it, it boils down to basically two things they consume a lot of memory so that you can't even fit them on your laptop, and they take a lot of time. Okay, the other problem is that as the models become large, um, they don't have continuous convex surfaces and it becomes very difficult to solve them. Then you have to go through approximation methods and other classical methods to solve them. We don't have that time to, to, to wait. So I decided to say, okay, let's see if I can change, change the, the way we are looking at the game. If, if I don't have the hardware, like the supercomputing resources, then what if I can do something about the code that is actually running on, on the hardware. So I started writing my own optimization algorithm. Okay, bear in mind these complaints, the, the memory factor, dealing with um, non-convex surfaces, um, running at, let's say, at very high performance on, on a low cost or an embedded system. Okay. So as I was working, I, I got to look at a lot of benchmark functions. Actually, I, I worked with over 58 different benchmark functions. But I got interested in the gray rank function. And if you look at the gray rank function, it's, it's very compute intensive. That's why I decided to focus on it, leaving the other um, function. But so you have to do, if you look at the first term, you are doing the square okay, of, your, of your variable to the number of dimensions you are doing. So if you are doing 1 million, so you are then just doing that and summing. Then you are doing the multiplication and the cost. And when you go into computing, you realize that some things are very expensive, like the, the cosine and the square root are very, very computationally expensive once you want to do them. So you're doing that, let's say, for one million times per each iteration and summing. 
it actually takes quite a very long time to, to compute. So I focused on the Greenhouse function. And one of my colleagues who was working on that, um, he used the SEU, the Shuffle Complex Evolution Algorithm, which is, um, like, let's say, it was derived from the genetic algorithm, and it's, it's better. And he worked with that, and he was able to just run that for only 50 variables, decision variables, on a 12 gig RAM. Okay, so with 12 gig RAM, he was able to run for 50 variables. And I wanted to deal away with no memory at all, so I decided to work with my own um, algorithm. So I decided to rewrite my algorithm. So if you look at the general optimization problem, okay, um, you have a model that you have several let's say, inputs, okay, let's say variables x, and for which each of them you might, you must find one specific point for each parameter space that when you input into your model, you get the minimum. That's all we are, we are doing for um, the optimization, but once you are trying to solve it. So I came up with a, a, a simple concept which um, is illustrated, okay. So the question is, almost all optimization models are doing some sort of something. Most of them are stochastic or they are either following the curve or the derivative or something else to, to, to sample a point and to trial it. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is it possible for me to actually do just a, a single sweep, just one point sampling? So I wouldn't have to do all the other sampling. And in that way, I will actually reduce the computation. So the question was how to be able to guess um, effectively those sampling points within each parameter space for, for that. Okay. So um, I, I developed that and I, I did work on that, okay, I, I, and I got my results. And the question was, it, was it, did it really work? And actually nobody believed that it was going to work, including my supervisor at that time. Nobody believed, so they did work. So recently I just decided to put some of the results. It's been like over five years now. I've been always trying to improve it. Um, just September I decided to put some of the results I was getting onto archive, a Cornell University website. Okay. So I decided to put it there and see, and just share it, because um, I had people from Exeter University and they wanted to see if it worked. And I was surprised that once I put it there, within one week it was picked as one of the best um, emerging papers on MIT Technology Review. And I said, oh, really, then it means this is something that could be um, very impactful. So I just look at the, the, the results, what I actually got, okay? So first place, I compared it with two optimization algorithms, the Nelda Mead optimization algorithm, which is um, also known as the simplex algorithm. It's one of the classic algorithms which is used by US. Um, I think almost all the supercomputers, they run this for their optimization. I took that one, and I took a more recent one to the MASW chains algorithm. Um, this algorithm actually won the large scale um, competition algorithm by IEE. When they were working on 1,000 computers, it, it won it across almost all categories. So I decided to take these two, um, and I chose one, one result that was actually published recently. Some people tried to parallelize that algorithm to make it faster. So let's say, I say, let me compare my results with what these algorithms are. So with the Nerdamid algorithm, I took it from the source, um, and I ran it with the gray one function, and I took the results that has been published on the MASW chains running on GPU, and I compared it. So first thing is um, with the Nelda Mead, which is the NMM, if you can see, as the dimensions were increasing from two to one million, okay, I was actually running this on my laptop, okay, I was able to run one million decision variable optimization on my laptop, okay. The Nelda Mead only got to um, 10,000 and it starts crashing. It can't even run further. Because upon analysis, I realized that that was requiring about 40 gig of RAM. And mine algorithm running one million decision variables was only needing, um, for double precision, was only needing 7.8 gig of RAM. So if you can compare, um, I mean one billion, not one million, one billion. So one billion, 7.8 gig of RAM with Nelda Mead, which was, um, which is used by NASA and all for uh, US, that needs 40 gig of RAM for 10,000. Like we realized that the optimization algorithm was, was actually far efficient. 
if you also look at um, the computational time, okay, that I made for just 1,000, um, it took about 59 seconds and it, it hung. So you couldn't find a solution for the gray one crunch because this is very multi multinodal. But even with my for 1 billion, I could, I could run the same problem for 1 billion and that took about um, almost 18 hours. It was 17 hours, 55 minutes. It just ran on my laptop. And when I look at that result and I compare to when Google first did their, their AI network for image recognition, okay, the ImageNet, and they ran it, they did, they built a one billion neural network. They used 1,000 computers, each of, each of them was dual core, so eight cores, um, eight core CPUs, so 16 core by 1,000, and it took three days, and I ran one billion of um, optimization just on a single machine, not parallelized, um, just single threaded, and it takes just 18 hours. Then it realized means that the, the efficiency was actually um, good. Okay, then I compared it to the um, MASW chains, and similar, similarly to my algorithm was doing far better. They did the comparison on 50,000 50, function evaluations. So for 100,000, they, they were getting um, 49,000, almost 50,000 seconds for doing a 50,000 function evaluations. And my algorithm was, was doing, the, the raw one was doing, the original one I created was doing 1,000 seconds on the 50 m for the same problem. And I've actually re recently improved it, and that one is taking just 1.1 seconds. So compare 1.1 seconds to um, 50,000, you could see a much wider difference. Then they paralyzed the, the, the algorithm to run on GPUs. So I also did the same with my algorithm to run on GPUs. So for the 100,000, they were running at um, 1,000 seconds, and I was running at 2.1 seconds. And for 3 million, they are running at 8,600 seconds, and I was running at actually 7.5 seconds on the same problem. So I, it became interesting. So this, this thing is, is good, okay. So just on one laptop, um, I'm not consuming memory. I'm running as fast as I could. Could this be done on mobile phones and other embedded systems? Okay, so I actually have my mobile phone here. Probably if you, you might want to see me run it, okay. But to run just 1,000 decision variables, I'm not sure if I try to run problems up to 1,000. It just takes 0 0.1 seconds on this Samsung Note 4, the same problem. Um, it's, the code is not optimized for mobile phones, but I'm able to run that one. And I'm able to run up to 100 million decision variables on this mobile phone. I did that with um, the Raspberry Pi. I was able to go to 10 million decision variables, and all of us were, were running fast. And then I realized that even though in Africa we might not have the, the resources to actually compete with the West, we could actually change the, the rules of the game by rewriting um, our codes and algorithms, taking into effect some of the limiting factors that we know, and also um, achieve their best. Thank you. Okay, you like your speed. It's true, your algorithm really works on speed. But there is this thing on my mind. What about accuracy? We saw you quickly skip it, but that's what you want to know. Accuracy. Yeah, so um, I was actually surprised that it was very accurate and precise. You didn't give us statistics on that. Okay, probably uh, we should get a prepared and, and look at the results, and I could run on you just on my mobile phone and you should, you should check. Because the, for the gray one function, the, the actual solution was to, is to be zero. For If you take the MASW chains, they were getting like, like for 500,000 function evaluations, they, they were getting around, um, they say 10 to, it was 2.9 times 10 raised to the power two, okay. But I was getting 10 raised to the power minus 12. Okay, that was the solution I was getting. It's all within minus 12, okay. And for, and for, that's for double precision, and for single precision, it's on minus four, 10 to the power minus four. So it's zero, um, let's say, about four decimal places after, after zero, which I think is, is highly accurate compared to other 
um, known algorithms that e exist. Okay, again, um, we saw the statistics are right. But in the presentation, you mentioned that we have to pick a special kind of variable and then use the algorithm on. And that we didn't see how that is done in your code or in your work. Okay, so if you look at the gray one function, um, let me, okay. So gray one function, if you look at it carefully, you have um, xi, so that's your dimension. So if it's one to 1,000 or if it's 10, so each, each of the xi is a different variable that must be solved. Okay, and most models um, work, work that way. If you take, if you're doing um, those that will put in folding, okay, they look at it as, as energy cost. If those are doing graph optimization or um, the traveling salesman problem, if you are doing routing, okay, or let's say what I did, the first one I did was a hydrological model to do flat forecasting. You have different parameters that you, you want to solve. So it's those parameters that I call the variables. So as large as you have them, Okay, the, the larger they, they, be, they become, the more difficult it is for you to solve them. Okay, even in, in AI, artificial intelligence, we talk about calibrating the weights. Those are your variables. So the, the larger they are, the more difficult it is for, for you to solve or to train your uh, AI. I'm saying that with this algorithm, it becomes easier to even solve some of these things without needing um, supercomputers. You can just do them on your mobile phones and, and, and your laptops. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering um, why you used the very large, but I think in your presentation I understood. I mean, mentioning that um, huge number, I mean millions. Um, thank you very much. I mean, for <laughs> that nice presentation. I'm highly enthused. But uh, I want to know um, the, this gray one optimization function. Is it unconstrained or constrained? Um, the, the gray one cam is constrained it's within constrained. minus 600 and 600. No, I, I mean the, the, the variables in it. Um, yeah, is, it's constrained. It's constrained. Yeah. Oh, okay. Usually it's solved between minus 600 and 600, but you could change it. Okay. Um, some people use like minus 50 to 50 when they are testing it for the first time because as your, if, if you look at the diagram, okay, it's, it's like an air crate. So within minus yeah. 50 and 50, you have a lot of that's, this is for two dimensions, okay. so a, a, a lot of local minima. So if you have f 50 dimensions and you're doing minus 600 and 600, then you can imagine the, the lot, number, amount of local minima you, you, you get. So it's, it's almost um, a, a convex function. I mean, if that is a simulation. The, the, the gray one is not a convex function. It's multimodal. Okay. Okay, okay. and in all the dimensions. So this image is actually for two dimensions. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, my question is a little bit, is your algorithm open source so that maybe if someone wants to play around? <laughs> okay, so currently I'm, I'm trying to package it in a form that and, and people can use, so okay. very soon it, it will be out. Yeah. That would be nice. And interesting enough, it's, it's, it's not big, it's, it's very small. The okay. core code is around 20 lines. As far as it's around, it's around 10 kilobytes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. And <clears throat> please, my question is regard to, are you just looking at it on the aspect of you writing a publication and that's all? Or are you looking at, because Ghana, we are rich based on your presentation, we are blessed. Mm -hmm. If NASA can use this, then if they are using ones, some that are not highly even efficient compared to yours, then we are blessed as a country. So what are you, what's the way forward for you in person and in connection to maybe Ghana at large? Okay, okay. so um, the, the way forward actually is to, I'm actually working on building a chip, a hardware processor based on the concept of this algorithm. And, in, in that way to make it even far faster to, to actually process. The idea is that I see that many, not many people have access to this cloud computing resources and that stuff. So if you have like a, a chip like a USB, which you can just plug into your machine 
and, and run oil programs faster, just compile to it. So I'm working on that um, framework, so the chip and the SDK to make it easier um, to run some of these things. And I'm sure it will outperform all the other embedded chip systems. I know in Intel is doing one, okay, with the um, Intel Nirvana chip and the mobile eye chip by Intel. I know um, Google has their TPU, okay, there's also the, the recent one, Graph Core, okay, they just, they just finished with their chip and it's far faster. So I'm, I'm sure mine will outperform them because they are using, they are still using classical methods of, of doing that. So this will actually outperform and make it far faster. And aside this, I've, we've run this with other systems. I have a friend, um, he's a Ghanaian, he, he works on some projects. In, in, he's in the US, okay. So for, on the navigation systems that they are trying to develop, for the US and other stuff. We ran this on, on the data to see if it was going to work with the tracking and it outperformed it. Okay, um, the, the system they are building, because optimization is expensive, they can't fix all the, uh, should I say, all the codes on embedded systems like this tracking devices and other stuff. So we just ran this and it's actually outperformed it. So we are, we are thinking if it's in the chip form, it comes easier to port it to other platforms and other devices. Chairman. Yeah, thanks for, for that presentation. Um, this algorithm that you have is heuristic, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, have you tried to check with um, other, something else from this function that's... Yeah, right? so that I mentioned them, um, M -A -S -W -A okay. it's the SWA okay? It's a memetic algorithm, and they are combining the SW chains, which is also stochastic to it, and Based on all other tests, that's the best algorithm so far for large scale optimization. So I've checked with that one. And Using heuristic, but I'm talking about a, a typical non heuristic method. Yeah, so the simplex method is not a heuristic method. The Nedamid method. The Nedamid method, it, anyway, don't worry, it's okay. Yeah. yeah it's, it's heuristic, but it's okay. Okay. So on that note, we want to thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, at the beginning, uh, people were asking what, we, what mathematics could be used for. I think some of those people are getting answers now. Uh, we want to thank you so much for your patience. Tomorrow we start at 9 a.m. with a lecture from Dr. Florian Duster. So we want to encourage everyone to be here on time so that we start. Thanks so much for your patience today. Yes, so. The, those who will be presenting tomorrow, the names will be displayed on the on the screen shortly, and you can check their website for the conference. And then the names are there, and the order is there. So once again, thanks so much for today. We are very grateful. See you tomorrow. Thank you, and God bless. Shall we put our hands together for ourselves? Um, a short announcement. Um, there are, we are going to provide some T-shirts at the registration center, so all of us here should try and get one of the T-shirts for this conference. Thank, Thank you. See my stubborn people. Mm, they gave you a headache. Eh? <laughs> no. They were cool, eh?